The next session is going to be on BEX or bioenergy plus carbon capture and storage. So <clears throat> to contrast BEX with some of the other carbon dioxide removal strategies or negative emission strategies, um, one of the benefits of BEX is it both provides bioenergy plus carbon capture all at the same time. You know, so the basic idea of BEX is that you grow plants which are capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. You take that uh, bioenergy and you convert it to electricity or liquid fuels. Uh, and in the process, you can store the carbon emissions. So you get sort of two, two for one. Uh, and if we look, if we compare that to DAC, for example, um, you know, DAC basically requires, as we've heard, a lot of energy uh, and it doesn't produce energy. So that's not to say that DAC isn't good and isn't going to be useful, but uh, <clears throat> really I think the key benefit is that you get two services or two benefits for one basic uh, investment. So joining us today to talk about this are two fantastic speakers. Um, as you heard from Sarah earlier, uh, Kat Reynolds from Drax was not able to join us today, but we do have someone to take her place. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Matthew Langholz. He's a natural resource economy in the bioenergy group at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's the principal investigator of the supply analysis project at Oak Ridge. And his interests include bioma uh, biomass energy resource economics, uh, short rotation woody crops, bioenergy with CCS, and bioenergy from forest resources. Uh, he also brings international experience with uh, agroforestry extension in Latin America uh, with the Peace Corps, and also has worked on a number of other uh, commercial and private sector projects. And he also brings experience in working in the Gulf Coast context for BECS in particular. So our next speaker will be E.J. E. J. Beck from uh, Stanford University. She's a PhD student, actually just about to wrap up in energy resources engineering. And she works on energy systems analysis, particularly focused on decarbonization of the electricity sector, uh, including assessing the roles of BECS in decarbonizing um, uh, electricity production. She recently completed a multi-year study together with uh, NRDC, E3, and Princeton University on lowest cost pathways to meet 100% clean energy in, in the California grid. And also as part of a, a Stanford team, uh, she led an effort to assess the near-term potential of bioenergy plus CCS in uh, the US. She'll be talking about that work today. And she was also a part of the Net Zero America project led by Princeton University. And finally, for the uh, Q&A session, we also have uh, Abhishek uh, Kasturi, who's a PhD student from Georgia Tech, and he works on the engineering aspects of, of BEX. So uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Matthew, who will begin uh, to make his prepared remarks. Here with Abhishek Kasturi to back me up on the uh, engineering uh, aspects of this. So um, the 2018 IPCC report includes um, BEX among its solutions to becoming carbon neutral by 2050. So if we're really great at reducing emissions um, in the near term, then maybe we don't need BEX. And if we're not so good at reducing emissions, maybe we need a lot of BECs. So path, illustrative pathways two, three, and four include BECs as um, part of the solution to carbon neutrality. To estimate globally the potential to sequester about five gigatons per year of CO2 through BECs in the range of 100 to $200 per ton uh, CO2. There's been previous research on the potential for BEX in the US, looking at uh, the potential to sequester in the Western US, potential to sequester um, CO2 from corn ethanol plants, a relatively uh, pure stream, maybe a low hanging fruit of BEX, and um, an analysis of the potential uh, scale of BEX in the US. And uh, this research builds on that last piece there by adding uh, cost. Uh, 
to the potential scale. And we use the carbon avoidance cost curve where you have your levelized cost of electricity from BEX, your levelized cost of electricity from a reference scenario like coal or natural gas to give you how much more expensive this system is than a reference scenario. You have emissions from a reference scenario and emissions from your BEX scenario. If these emissions are negative, you have minus and negative. So you have uh, total avoided CO2 emissions, which gives you your dollar per ton CO2. Um, note that this includes not just sequestered CO2, but also avoided CO2 emissions. I might come back to that towards the end. So our modeling approach, um, we include uh, county level biomass feedstocks from the 2016 billion ton report. We use a uh, geographical information systems facility fighting, uh, siting model, um, account for biomass, um, um, logistics and transportation CO2 emissions and costs in a biomass logistics model. Um, use a, um, a, a power engineering model to account for CCS uh, efficiencies and economics. And we have CO2 um, assumptions in multiple parts of the supply chain from, the, from a CO2 model from Argonne National Lab. I'm just going to touch on the first two uh steps here and happy to follow up um, as there may be interest in the other aspects here so on the feedstock side um, that uh, we use county level biomass uh resources from the uh 2016 billion ton report available at this link um, and this is biomass feedstocks kind of as a function of price and and scenario assumptions um, <coughs> So a really high level look at biomass resources in the US in the near term using about 365 million tons of biomass, largely waste wood to energy and corn grain to ethanol. We also have resources that exist today but are unused, um, about 100 million tons each of wastes, forest land resources and agricultural residues. Each one of these resource types is a chapter in the billion ton report and it's is its own deep dive involving economics and sustainability and availability and all that stuff. So just a real high level um, for the near term in this analysis, we look at forest land resources and agricultural residues. If there is a demand market signal for biomass energy crops over time, you could see um, growth of, bio of energy crops over time. And the long-term scenario in this BEX analysis uh, adds energy crops to those resources. And the total supply looks something like this, near-term supply, long-term supply, different types of biomass at different available at different price points. And we have the spatial availability of those different types of resources, corn stover, for example, that exists today and energy crops that potentially could exist in the future. Um, our siting model, where we basically just down select for those saline sequestration basins and avoid wetlands, protected lands, slope, hazard areas, and just um, identify lands that we think might be suitable for BEX. And that results in these white points here, a subset of candidate facilities where we simulate uh, potential demand for uh, BEX sites. So our scenarios and our analysis, um, like I mentioned, we have near-term and long-term biomass resource supply. In our biomass logistics, we have conventional logistics, bales and chips, advanced logistics where we pelletize, simulate pelletizing. Um, simulate integrated gasification combined cycle and pulverized combustion systems. And we kind of run these models uh, incrementally, um, seeing kind of the cheapest 10% of available CO2 that we can sequester, 20% and march it forward up to 90%. And that allocation looks something like this. So like uh, near term, long term, this is an example from IGCC. This is conventional. Uh, bales and chips, this is pelletized. Anyways, like these concentrations, these blue dots here, that's kind of like the low hanging 10% uh, where BEX might start. And the yellow aggregations are the 50%. Uh, if you capture 50% of the 
or the cheapest 50% of the CO2, what that aggregation might look like. The red being a 90%, we're not suggesting that we would push it out that far because it's the higher fruit, if you will. Overall results uh, tend to look something like this, where you might have some net benefit in, in soil organic carbon. You have emissions and harvest transportation and um, losses at the power plant, and you have um, CO2 captured and some net capture rate. Um, and you, it increases with uh, demand. And our carbon avoidance cost curves uh, look like this. So here's um, that coal reference scenario and the natural gas combined cycle reference scenario. Um, Near term biomass supplies, and then three long term supplies looking at IGCC conventional logistics, IGCC pelletized biomass, and pulverized coal, also pelletized biomass. Um, oh, and, and just to mention, these are different axes here. So just if you're interpreting that, keep that in mind. So in summary, we're looking at um, carbon avoidance costs in the range of about 40 to $140 per ton CO2. And I just wanna mention, of course, our equation includes not just sequestered CO2, but also avoided emissions. And honestly, it's not clear to me at this point if everyone is handling that the same. So part of the reason why this starts relatively low is because like I say, in the denominator, we also have avoided emissions from a reference scenario. So it'd be interesting to follow up and see if we're all looking at that uh, the same way. Um, we're looking at potential sequestration of about 180 million tons per year in a near-term feedstock scenario, about 700 million tons in a long-term scenario, consistent, uh, at least in the range, I believe, with results from Bayek et al, who I didn't know I would be speaking with today. So I'm glad I tagged you there. So if you looked at this 180 million tons per year up to 2040, and if you looked at this 740 million tons per year up to 2100, then the U.S. could sequester maybe 45, 46 billion tons of CO2 by 2100, which is about 30% of pathway number two, or about 4% of the target for pathway number four. So the U.S. can contribute something. Um, to global uh, CO2 uh, sequestration targets with BECs. Um, but realistically, we're not gonna be able to do all this with BECs. There are competing demands for the biomass resources, some future work. Um, I, I'm sure others are thinking about, you know, in the uh, last session, Claude mentioned the need for carbon-free steam and power. Is there a synergy between BECs and DAC? Um, there are opportunities to use liability wood, forest stains, hurricane debris, beetle, beetle kill. There's some real environmentally and economically low hanging fruit opportunities to do this, I believe. And there are other logistics scenarios that can improve efficiencies. Grateful for the opportunity. Back to you, Sally. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Um, EJ, let's move on to you. Thanks for having me and really excited to be a part of this discussion today. So today I'll be discussing the study that Matt briefly mentioned on geospatial analysis of near-term potential for carbon negative bioenergy in the U.S. As Sally had mentioned before, there are different components of BECs. We first need the biomass, uh, you then need to transport it often with rail or by truck, and then you have to capture the CO2 uh, at some point, and then that produces some form of energy. But once the CO2 is captured, we need to transport the CO2 and store it. Now, most studies, previous studies that have been assessing the potential of BECs have focused on the availability of the biomass often. But in the near term, the transportation of both biomass and CO2 may be the larger limiting factor for BEX deployment. And that's because transportation of biomass is not economic over long distances due to the, long ener uh, sorry, the low energy content and high moisture content. And also, as you know, the previous session discussed, establishing and building new CO2 pipelines is not only costly, but will also be very time consuming as well. And so what we tried to do in this study was to determine the near-term potential for BECs in the U.S. by looking at regions with co-located biomass and suitable storage sites. So we conducted geospatial analysis of biomass availability as well as suitable storage sites. And I'll, throughout this presentation, I'll be going through each one of these maps and we'll discuss the results and the implications. 
So first, let's think about biomass availability. So the biomass data comes from uh, the billion ton study that Matt had mentioned. And this is the county level biomass availability in 2040. So in 2020, though, the total available biomass in the U.S. that could be used for BEX is approximately 370 to 400 megatons of CO2. Now, if you look at the mix of this, 50% of it is agricultural residue, 40% of it is woody biomass and residue, and only 10% is dedicated energy crops. But as we go into 2040, the total available biomass increases significantly to over 1,000 megatons of CO2 per year, 70% of which is now dedicated energy crops. So we'll briefly discuss the implications of this assumption uh, later on, but it's a pretty uh, large amount of biomass or CO2 that is able to be sequestered. So now let's take a look at the storage sites. In thinking about storage sites, uh, we want to, we care about basically the storage capacity of each of the storage sites. So how much CO2 can a site store? And we get data on these storage sites from the USGS National Assessment of Geologic Carbon Dioxide Storage Resources. So first, storage capacity. There needs to be sufficient capacity, and USGS estimates that the aggregated storage capacity is about 3,000 gigatons. And so given the previous slide, we said that we have at most 1,700 megatons, which is approximately 1.7 gigatons of CO2. So we assume, I think based on that, it's safe to assume that aggregate storage capacity is likely not going to be a limiting factor for near-term BEX. But when we consider regional storage capacities, we can see that they do vary drastically. And so this is a map that shows the different storage capacities across the different basins that we analyzed. And so you can see that across different regions, the storage capacity varies widely. California is pretty favorable as well as the Gulf region. So we wanted to see if regional storage site capacity could be a limiting factor uh, for BACs in the future. So we'll, we're, we did a simple analysis. We basically assumed that all the CO2 from the biomass produced on top of that storage site will be sequestered in that site. And we took the time frame from 2020 to 2100, so long-term storage of CO2. And this is basically what resulted. So each of the bars here indicate the storage capacities of the different basins that we considered for storage. And note that this is a log logarithmic scale, so there's a lot of difference across the different basins. The orange dots then indicate the percentage of storage sites that can be utilized from 2020 to 2100. And so you can see that in most of the cases, the storage capacity used remains below 10 or even 20%, meaning there likely isn't a limitation in the amount of uh, CO2 that can be stored from BEX in these storage sites. But two storage sites in particular, the Black Warrior Basin located in Mississippi and the Kansas Basin, basin located in Kansas actually fill capacity by the end of the century. You can see that it's on the top of that. And you can see that both storage sites actually have capacities of less than a gigaton. And so from this analysis, we conclude that storage sites with capacities of less than a gigaton may not be suitable for BEX deployment, largely due to the risks associated with limited capacity in the long run. So next, we'll move on to another storage site characteristic, which is injectivity. So injectivity is a characteristic that determines the rate at which CO2 can be uh, sequestered within a given storage site. And lower injectivity storage, storage sites indicate higher risks of pressure buildup during injection, as well as a higher percentage or risk of leakage. And so storage injectivity is something that can be calculated given the porosity, permeability, and depth of each storage site, all of which data that we did have from the USGS analysis. And so then we created a map of looking at the different injectivities across the different storage sites. And you can see that the scale here uh, ranges briefly, but you can see the grayed out parts range from zero to 0.25 megatons of CO2 uh, injected per year. And we assume that storage sites with injectivity of less than 0.2 megatons of CO2 per year might not be suitable for injection because of this low injectivity risk. And to put that number into scale, Right now, most commercial scale injection projects globally are, up, are at the scale of approximately a megaton of CO2 per year. So anything below a quarter of that might not be suitable for commercial scale deployment of BEX. 
and regional injectivity, of course, widely varies across the different regions. So finally, we've looked at the biomass, we've looked at the capacity, and we've looked at the injectivity, and we've come up with our final results. And so this is a map that shows the co-located biomass potential and storage sites. So these are the areas that we think would be the most suitable for near-term BEX deployment because of the presence of both biomass and suitable storage sites. Uh, and this is all of the potential that would, could be assessed without any transportation infrastructure. And you can see that approximately a third of the biomass producing counties are co-located with the storage site, which translates to about a thousand counties in the US, which is really non-trivial. And so going back to our total potential that we were talking about, uh, in 2020, if the total available potential was approximately 400 metric tons of CO2 per year, you can see that there are only approximately 100 that are co-located with a storage site. And just to put that number into context, the current US CO2 emissions is approximately 5,000 megatons of CO2 per year. So all in all, um, it, it's not a huge chunk of the pie in negative emissions, but it is still a pretty a large share of it. And in 2040, because of the increase in the biomass potential, we see that the near-term potential of co-located storage and biomass capacity increases up to 360 to 630 megatons of CO2 per year. Now, I want to put that number into context a bit further as well. So what I did was take a figure from Peters and Geden that looked at the BEX deployment rates across different integrated assessment models. And this, these different lines show different models and different analyses. And you can see that the black line there is the median of these models on the amount of BEX potential that needs to be deployed to meet the two degree C goal for the US. And what you'll see there then is that the median in 2045 is approximately 400 megatons of CO2 per year. And so you can see that that falls very nicely within our kind of estimated near-term potential of 360 to 630 megatons of CO2 per year. But there is of course a caveat, and this goes back to where this biomass is coming from. And you'll see that this biomass mix is approximately 70% of energy crops. And energy crops right now aren't currently commercially deployed uh, across the US. And so there needs to be a lot of time in, in developing these energy crops and making sure that they are kind of at the scale that we need them to be to make sure that we are able to access uh, this potential. And so in other words, without any energy crops, if we weren't, aren't able to develop it in time, the 2040 negative emissions benefit from BEX could be as low as approximately 100 megatons of CO2 per year. So that's just something to consider as well. And so in conclusion, we found that approximately 30% of the biomass potential in the US is overlapping with a storage site. Um, and this results in negative emissions potential in the US of approximately 100 to you know, 400 megatons of CO2 per year in the long run. The BEX potential, as you can see on the map on the left, is pretty widespread, but there are areas or hotspots that seem very favorable for deployment, particularly uh, in the Gulf region there. And so what we hope that this analysis can do is help define the near-term opportunities that minimize the social and economic barriers to BEX deployment as well. Now, before I pass it back to Sally, I also wanted to briefly introduce another study that I was part of, which is the Net Zero America Project. And this was a study that what looked at uh, pathways, infrastructure, and impact of reaching a net zero carbon economy in 2050 in the US. And one of the main conclusions that came out for this was that, uh, I've highlighted it there, is that among a lot of different things that needs to happen, bioenergy and other zero carbon fuels and feedstocks is going to be an incredibly important pillar in making sure we reach a net zero carbon economy. And just as proof of that, um, I won't go into too much depth into the details, but this shows basically across the different scenarios we looked at how much of the biomass was utilized. And essentially all of the biomass that we put out as available in 2050 is utilized by 2050, emphasizing the importance of this fuel uh, in reaching an net zero economy. And what's interesting though, is that um, the biomass is used in a lot of different ways. There are some that are negative emissions technologies. As you can see, the ones with carbon capture are negative emissions. And the most prominent negative emission technology is actually producing hydrogen with biomass. And so it just kind of 
shows the potential of biomass to reduce, uh, to be serve as a negative emissions potential while not only producing uh, electricity, but also other very important types of fuels such as hydrogen. And in this scenario, we also did do a very downscaled spatial resolution, uh, but instead we now added uh, the ability to build CO2 transportation pipelines, not only for biomass, but for a lot of other industrial sources as well. So you can see that the National CO2 Transport and Storage Network looks something like this. And you can see that the green dots are really widespread across all of the US. And so if we really want to access uh, the biomass effectively, there will need to be a, a form of CO2 pipeline that's built effectively as well. So the, in good news, the CO2 pipeline, as the previous session members mentioned, could be utilized for a lot of other sources, such as gas uh, and industry. And so with that, I will finish my slide and pass it back to Sally. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, EJ, and thank you, Matthew. Um, that was uh, both fantastic talks. Um, I want to go and start with, with Matthew. You sort of gave us a teaser at the very end, talking about the synergies between uh, BEX and DAC. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that a little more? I, I added that uh, as during the tee up here. Uh, it's something I've thought of before. And I've only thought of it, but I think we have to look at it. If you need power for DAX, you need power for DAC, and uh, bioenergy with CCS maybe could contribute to that. That's really all I was thinking. Open to any suggestions. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. No. Thank. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I've been thinking about that for quite a while as well. Okay. All right. Um, EJ, I want to go back to you and and ask you a little bit about what you learned from the California Energy. Um, electricity system modeling work that you did, and and you included the potential for bioenergy plus CCS in those modeling studies. Could you just say a little bit about the the approach you used to those studies, and say you know how much BEX was used, and you know what did it provide a valuable contribution to de uh, decarbonizing the electricity sector? Yeah, of course. So in the model, we were using a very detailed electricity system model that not only looked at the capacity needs in the future of meeting future load and policy goals, but also making sure we simulated the model on an annual basis to make sure reliability uh, was given. And so we had a pretty conservative assumption on the amount of effects that could be deployed, and the study was specifically for California. And so what we assumed was that all of the existing biomass power plants in California could be retrofit. So that just for perspective is not a lot. It's approximately 500 megawatts, uh, not even a, giga, a gigawatt of capacity. But even with that small amount of BEX, uh, the model, even with a high cost, chose to make sure that those resources were retrofitted with carbon capture and storage for two reasons. Um, the first one is just the negative emissions potential that came from uh, deploying BEX within the system really helped uh, make sure that other resources such as gas could operate in the system and uh, make, maintain reliability throughout the year. And the second one, of course, is that uh, the amount of energy that was produced was actually very valuable as well. So what we saw in simulating uh, the system with BEX is that not only was BEX very built uh, despite the high cost, but also that it was operated on an annual basis, on a constant manner, to provide that energy as well as negative emissions potential. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we will um, start with a, a question now from the audience. Um, and so this is from uh, Ole uh, Agassan. Um, the question is that electric electrification of light duty vehicles is likely to reduce the demand for ethanol. Um, and today we blend about 10% in, into, uh, into gasoline. So as that demand uh, drops for, for ethanol, um, can, you know, can you imagine that the, those same cropland could be switched to other energy crops and, and what might that be? And particularly in the context of something that might be more of a drop-in fuel that would be a one-for-one -one substitute for a diesel or, or gasoline. If I could take a stab, the short answer is yes. We're absolutely considering that. So um, I think it's about uh, 290 million acres of cropland, about, I want to say, a third of that in corn, and I want to say about half of that 
maybe a third of that to a half of that. I'm not sure, don't quote me, going to ethanol. So you're talking about tens of millions of acres of new land available. And in the mix, that alone would cover the amount of energy crop land base that we're talking about, which was about 8% at the high end, 8% uh, of ag land going to energy crops. And I could go further into strategies to do that. Um, we're not talking about putting it up. Basically, there are probably agricultural lands where perennial energy crops have environmental and economic uh, benefits and potentially advantages. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So, so maybe just to follow up on that, that, uh, you know, if you look to 2040, um, you know, both the work that you talked about and EJ talked about the, you know, uh, importance of these bioenergy crops, you know, what mechanisms are in place today or what mechanisms would be needed in the future to, you know, stimulate uh, that kind of development? The price, the market signal. Mm -hmm. Farmers respond to changing markets all the time, and uh, they can respond to demand for biomass energy crops or anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so incentives. All right. Just on the perspective of effects and developing a lot of different negative emission technology, whether that's to produce electricity or fuel, I think another large limitation is again the the transportation of CO two and the availability of storage sites. So. Going back to what was mentioned in the previous session, you know, there needs to be a large push to establish CO2 storage sites and a potential network that a farmer can easily access and if there is a price later take advantage of. But I think without that, uh, the transition will be very difficult to make. So it's a chicken and an egg problem, but I think uh, the storage CO2 storage and transportation network might be the easier thing to develop because it can be utilized across a lot of different industries and sectors as well. Okay, thank you, EJ. So, so, so Matt, sort of back to you on, on this issue of competition uh, with food, uh, you know, competition for food crops and land and, and so forth. You know, this is one of the sort of elephant in the room issues about, about BEX. Um, so, and, and particularly in the context of the international um, yeah, experience that you've had, um, you know, what can you tell us about competition, you know, for land between food and bioenergy crops? Yep. So in our, uh, so we use the policy analysis system economic model that simulates the U.S. agricultural sector, and it includes demands for food, feed, fiber, ethanol that might be out, becoming outdated, and exports, and we satisfy those demands before we add energy crops. There's about 5% annual variability of cropland in the US every year. And we're talking about using 8%, up to 8% of uh, cropland or pasture land for biomass energy crops. So we're looking at this in ways that perennial biomass energy crops could be put in say streamside management zones or marginal lands or complement uh, the agricultural systems in ways that don't compromise uh, food production and do enhance environmental benefits, um, improve biodiversity, reduce um, uh, nitrogen runoff to waterways, improve water quality, things like that. So just depends on how we do it. Okay, all right. So, um, so you know, another question in the vein of, you know, sort of some of the, the risks of, of of uh, back. So, uh, you know, what percentage are you assuming for the agricultural residue that would be available for BEX? And it's, you know, is you know, over 20 per 30 percent removal of the stover, for example, can negatively impact soil health and yield. So, yeah, what are your assumptions? And, and is this a, you know, how is this concern being addressed? So it's constrained with the, it's constrained with two, um, erosion models, um, WEPS and Russell 2. I might be hard pressed to spell those all out right now. Um, you know, in summary, we capture about half of the total stover supply at a maximum. So about 100 million tons per year of stover, that's about half of the total stover actually available. And basically there are, um, so in the middle of the corn belt where you have an abundance of growth, you have an abundance of stover, and in that area, stover can kind of be a liability for production, and that's where we concentrate our uh, stover availability. When you get on that, um, when you get on drier lands, that's where we don't harvest, we don't 
our modeling doesn't capture uh, stover and drier areas because it's needed there for wind and water erosion. But, um, till versus no-till agriculture could play a big role in this. If you're doing no-till agriculture, then potentially you can get a lot more stover. There are different trade-offs here. Okay. All right. So, so maybe we'll have a question for for Abishak that, um, you know, the, the, this is from one of our attendees that you know isn't direct capture at an industrial source more efficient compared to Bex. So, and you know, how can you sort of justify the economics of of investing in Bex as opposed to traditional uh, capture? Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about the efficiency of bioenergy conversion and uh, and then how might that compare to other industrial sources? Yeah, so I think one of the main things that BEX provides us is that it helps us produce energy as well. So we can sell that electricity. And another thing would be that I believe BEX is significantly cheaper than direct air capture, at least the technologies that are available today. And um, we did a bit of research and we found that, for example, if we pelletize our biomass feed, we can use them in pulverized combustion plants with very little modification to the existing system. So there are quite a few positive towards BEX that are there? Hope that answers that question. Okay. Um, all right. So a, a related question I don't think we got into on, on soil carbon is that, um, you know, we looked at Bex in the context of, you know, capturing, you know, the emissions when they're combusted and, and so forth. But what about sort of the, the co-benefits of, you know, trying to do Bex in such a way that you could really rebuild soil carbon stocks and get, uh, get more bang for the buck, so to speak? I'll take a stab. Yeah, absolutely. And we roughly quantify that in, in our analysis with um, kind of crop specific and cropland source specific soil organic carbon change uh, assumptions. So how, how much um, how much additional CO2, excuse me, how much additional carbon can you sequester in soils when you transition from that perennial crop, say corn for ethanol, like we were talking about, maybe I'm mixing up, an annual crop like that corn to ethanol we mentioned before and convert it to um, a deep rooted perennial switchgrass that you replant maybe once every 10 years instead of every year. Just by avoiding annual tillage, you increase soil organic carbon, and it's definitely a big, um, a big additional benefit. Okay, well, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, we've come to the end of our session, but uh, I think this was really informative and very helpful. And you know, this is clearly a topic. On 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 one hand, it's very exciting, uh, and on the other hand, you know, we hear from people who are concerned about um, the impacts of large scale deployment of BEX on on other ecosystem values, food, and so forth. So, I, I think that as we you know look into the future. Um, that uh, we're going to see a lot of interesting developments in this area. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. And uh, we will uh, turn this back over to uh, Sarah.